So um, I'd like to introduce uh, Robert, come up from here, because I'd rather you be up front. Um, Robert, Robert is also a, a financial advisor, like Sergio is. And I asked him to also join Sergio. Sergio said he might not be able to make it tonight because he has some things going on. But uh, both of these guys are going to be joining us um, for the nine weeks that we're doing this. We're on week three, Robert. And um, if you can just go ahead and give a little bit of uh, insight on what you do, which you're a home financial advisor, and um, and you offer to be here to assist us in any questions or answers that we might have. And I know you're familiar with uh, Dave Rand's course. You're also a graduate of, of, um, of Maxwell's uh, classes. So if you can just give a little background of, of those two things, that you, what you've done and how you've been able to help people. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, it, it's uh, first of all, uh, congratulations, and I want to acknowledge you guys because there could be a, a billion different reasons why you're not here today, right? But this is a big deal, and I'm sure you heard the videos, right? Seven out of ten people, seven out of ten people are broke. They live paycheck to paycheck in America. That's the state of America today, and the fact that that you guys are making a, a, a decision to say, you know what, I need to change what I'm doing and I need to I need to do something different. That's a big deal. Um, and you gotta respect that and give yourselves a lot of credit. The fact that you're even here learning about it because that most people won't even take that step. How do we know? Seven out of 10 people live paycheck to paycheck. So, right, this room should be full, right? There should be classes every day. Um, but so I just want to acknowledge you guys. It's encouraging to me to, to see people in general just saying, hey, you know what? I, I need to commit myself to, to a process, to something different. And I sat in the same chair. I took the class several times. I, I facilitated um, you know, with my wife as well um, over the course of, of the years through Christ Fellowship. Um, I'm a financial advisor. I work for Ameriprise Financial. Uh, and I have an affiliation with Centennial Bank, which is a community bank uh, here locally. So I help you know, people do financial planning. I, I had a conversation this morning in front of a group, and one of the things that I mentioned is you can either accept your life or you can design it, right? Most people live by default. It's like, hey, well, this happened, and, and they... You know, and, and now what do I do I'll now? Up a little bit, just so the microphone can pick you up. Oh, okay. we got a couple yeah. people online. Okay. Um, so I'm encouraged when people want to live by design. Those are the people that I I respond to, right? Because you're saying, you know what? No, I want to know, right? What what my life is going to look like. I want to design it. I want control. But what we find out is that you don't get control when you're under somebody else's control, right? The companies. The credit card companies, your mortgage company, they call the shots until you decide that, hey, you're going to give yourself some margin, some freedom. That's why it's interesting. It's called financial peace. Those words actually don't go together, you know, but that that's what happens. And I'll just share with you guys, I made a transition recently that if I had debt other than my mortgage, right, I couldn't have made that that choice. But I made a choice in the name of freedom and legacy and what I wanted for my family. But most people would just say, well, I'm stuck because I got my car payment. I got my, you know, I got my credit card debt, student loans. Hopefully they'll forgive them one day. No, they won't. They won't. Right. But at the end of the day, when you take that control back, now you have freedom to do other things and to do the things that, that God has put you on this earth to do. Right. Because a lot of times we forget. God has given us gifts, abilities and talents, not for ourselves, so that he can work through us to do in advance, right, the, the church. So it, it just a little bit about myself, right? I, I've been a financial advisor for 19 years. This is my 19th year. Um, this is not how I go dress to work, by the way. Um, my kids had soccer, but soccer got canceled at the last minute because of the rain. Um, but it, it's something that I've always found rewarding. I've always wanted to do just to help people have clarity about where they are today, which is the first step. You have to acknowledge where you are today. Uh, Dave Ramsey always says you can't outspend, you know, or out earn your stupidity is what he says, because many times that's what I thought, because I said, well, I can, 
I can make, you know, more, I can go out and make more, but I was never acknowledging what I needed to fix so that I can take advantage of the more that I was making instead of spending more. And that's an easy trap that many people fall into. So what you're learning here, right, is, is going to, is going to help you make a difference. How many of you have children? How many of you have young children or children under 18? How many of you have college age kids? Okay. One of the things that, that I always ask myself is, you know, because we like to talk to our kids, we like to tell them stuff, right? Hey, don't do that. Or, hey, do this, right? And at some point you have to realize like they're watching you. They're watching what you do. A lot of the times that we have the habits that we have as adults is because we learn that behavior. You just come up with it, you know, and many people, nobody talked to them about money. They learned it from seeing their parents either struggle or win with it. Most of us probably saw our parents struggle with it. I did. My parents filed for bankruptcy. You know, my dad had a small business. He tried to restart it multiple times. They, they were never able, never able to recover, really. So that's that was my front seat to money management. So this is an opportunity and I'm here to help you guys. I, I told uh, I told you guys, you know, I told Mike, I don't, um, I, I just wanna support you guys, whatever you need, whatever questions you have, I don't want anything from you guys, okay? I am, you know, God has blessed me with, you know, the situation that I'm in because I was obedient to doing the things and making the changes I needed to make. And the same is, is for you guys. I'm, you know, we, we have three little kids. My oldest is 13. I got an eight and a 10 year old. They're expensive, <laughs> right? It's expensive raising kids today. And I have these conversations with my daughter and it's funny because, you know, they don't know what it's like to have to go to the laundromat every Saturday, right? They have no idea what that is, right? They, they're like, hey, I guess what? I saw a Ferrari today. I'm like, that's great, son, right? Because we live in Palm Beach Gardens. Like, I didn't see a Ferrari until I visited Beverly Hills. I grew up in Southern California, right? And that was like a trip, you know, that my dad took us on one day. Went to Beverly Hills to drive by and, and check out the houses. But here they see it every day. So you're trying to teach and show your kids and people watching, like, but well, we're in a culture that's immersed by this, right? Everybody wants... Everybody needs, and it all boils down to needs and wants, and telling the difference between two. We try to teach kids when they're little, hey, you don't need that, you want that. But then we fail to, to remember the same principles ourselves. So it's important that we, you know, we distinguish between the two. And that's what I do, even whether you got $100,000, $10,000, $100, a million dollars, Five million dollars, the principles are the same. The principles don't change. And that's the first thing that he covers. He says it's a fallacy. You're 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 assuming, you're making assumptions about how people live and what they do. And it's you know, the fact that you're here and the fact that you're learning this is gonna make a big difference. So immerse yourself in it. I'll end with this. When he told me that. You guys were meeting, I took out my little, you guys know what this is, this is RFPU, right? It's our budget committee, it's our cash flow plan, right? We go through the same thing. It doesn't stop, right? I used to have this, any of you have this? Or is this too old school, right? right? And you put down your, you know, I had student loans at one point, paid them off, right? I, I had, you know, car loans and all that jazz. I, I, I needed to do a thousand dollar emergency fund. And then I'll end with this. This right here, I look at every day. You know what this is? Can anybody guess what I would possibly write in here? What should it be? Register? Huh? Or like to balance your checkbook? Your register? No, I want to go a little deeper than that. Okay. Yeah. What my goals. My goals. I write my goals. And I read them every morning and every night before I go to bed. And I don't write them from the perspective of what I want or you know income and so forth, but what I, what I want to do with it. So you'll find things like, I want to support causes that matter to our family. I want to bless others. 
I want to use our business to bless our employees, their families, and our clients. I want to have a platform to share Christ and biblical principles with others. See, those are the things that I write about. My question to you and my encouragement to you is what do you dream about? What do you want to accomplish? I know it's a tough time right now for business owners. I hear it every day. It's a tough time. And I'm going to tell you right now, as somebody that's been observing the economy for 19 years, it's probably going to get worse before it gets better. And then it's going to get better and it's going to get worse. And then it'll get better and then it'll get worse. But if you do this, if you do this, good times or bad times, you're going to be better regardless of whether it's a worse time or not. You'll be better off. Don't be a victim to circumstance, right? Write down what you want and go after it. You know, I, you've got to put your thoughts to paper. And then it's funny how the mind works, right? Because then you're going to you're gonna start thinking about ideas on, on how to do that. Things will make sense. You ever meet people who are unhappy with their jobs, but they can't quit because they got to pay the bills? You ever meet people like that? Don't raise your hand, but you might be people like that, right? But praise God if you don't have to do that. But praise God if you can work towards getting to the point where you don't have to do that. And I'm not going to sugarcoat it, right? It takes work. It takes time. But you'll be rewarded for your stewardship. You're honoring God, and he's going to honor you. Okay? So God bless you guys. And can I just pray really quick? Yes, please. Okay. Father God, I just thank you, Lord, everyone here. Lord, I thank you that you're with us. I thank you that we have the mind of Christ, Lord, that when we ask for wisdom, you freely give it. So we thank you, God, that we get to be here. We don't have to be here. We get to be here. We want to be better stewards, Lord, with what you've entrusted us. We don't own any of it. You do. And sometimes we don't act that way. We act like we produce it and, and we decide. And that's not been going very well, certainly not in our culture. But I just pray, God, that you would open our hearts and our minds ready to receive. But I want to pray for those that are business owners, those that are struggling right now. Lord, we forget that our number one weapon is prayer. And that we can always have hope that you'll help us, that you'll enable us, that you'll open the doors that we need. I pray for prosperity, Lord, for those businesses that are struggling. For those that are in situations, Lord, that they don't want to be in with their employers, would you open a door, God, as we're faithful, Lord, to do what we're supposed to do? We're confident, God, that you're going to open doors, you're going to give us favor, and that we can trust you. We thank you that no matter the circumstance, Lord, there is nothing too heavy, too difficult that you can do. You could do anything, God. And so we put our trust in you. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Robert. Sorry, I'm late. So um, just want to go over some notes here that I got. We just wrote them in the back. I'm gonna read them from my phone, but I, I wrote them. She's got them back there. But um, a special note that's not back there that I'll read. I, I wanted to remind you guys that nor Lourdes, nor I, or Dave Ramsey and his team um, are telling you what to do with your money. We're not. Uh, we are simply just giving you an option and resources that could get you out of, out of debt and make you debt free. This is all we're trying to do. Everything that Robert said, we're not telling you what to do with your money. God gives us free will. In Galatians 5.13, he, 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 he tells us that you're free to choose. But he warns you in that same verse, he says, but I warn you, don't need your freedom to indulge in a sinful nature. All right? And that's and, and, and money can have a tendency to make us indulge in our sinful natures because we have a tendency to go after what our flesh wants. Well, I want to get that car. I want a car. I want a car. Well, do you have the finances? It doesn't matter. I want a car. I'm going to get a car. And then you end up getting a car. And then you end up getting in debt. Or I want to. I want that clothes. I want that clothes. But you can't afford that clothes. No, but I'm going to get that clothes because I want it. And I want. And I want. And I want. And we do that with everything. I want. I want. I want. 
I learned early in business. Thankfully, God's blessed our business tremendously. But every time I did a job, I'd always bid a little higher when I needed a specific tool for that job. If the tool that I needed that job was $500 and the job was maybe $300, I'd bid $800. 300, $500 for the tool I needed, $300 for the job that, that the profit that I wanted to make on it. And it didn't cost me anything, but I got my tool. Now I had a tool for the next job. And I would do that with all my tools. I mean, I, I got a lot of tools. But all the tools I got, they're all paid cash for it. I didn't get into debt. I didn't go to, every time I go to Home Depot, you want a Home Depot car? No. Why? Because I don't want one. I don't need it. I can't afford it. I don't need it. I'll figure it out. I have to struggle. You know? You know, I can't tell you how many times I used a hammer to nail nails in until I can afford an air gun. And now I can shoot the nails in. But for many, many years, it was, I banged up my thumb and my fingers a lot, a lot of times. So understand that, guys. So a couple of notes that I have back there. Um, it says here, uh, personal finance is 80% behavior and only 20% head knowledge. This is from Dave Ramsey. Um, he also said, I challenge you to have the first complete monthly budget in place by the end of this week. We're hoping that by next week at your tables, coaches, please help those that need help, um, encouraging them. But we really want that everybody have their first monthly financial budget completed by our next session, if you haven't done so yet. Okay, so let's let's uh, let's 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 give ourselves that goal. And then uh, the next note I put here, and these these are notes from this book that I'm reading. These are this is a really really good book from Dave Ramsey. I I, I shared this last week with you guys. Complete Guide to Money. Um, and these are just notes that I'm pulling out of that book. Um, you'll never, in this one, I not only did I highlight it, but I underlined it. You will never experience genuine financial peace. You will never win with money until you do a budget. I, I not only highlighted it, but I underlined it. And you know, as you read the rest of that chapter, it's it's deep. You will never experience genuine financial peace. You will never win with money until you do a budget. Um, Wall Street Journal reported several years ago that 70% of Americans are living paycheck to paycheck. We heard, we, we heard Robert say that. Seven out of 10 people. Here it is. Dave Ramsey quotes it. Seven out of 10 people are living paycheck to paycheck. Um, last week, we heard um, Dave Ramsey shared um, how we see things, the perspective of how we see things, right? He says, a woman without a man is nothing. Remember that, that little clip he put there? A woman without a man is nothing. And then he goes on and he, and he says, well, let's punctuate it. I actually did this at work the other day. I started, I started doing it with guys at work. And every single one of them were mispunctuating it every single time. <laughs> I mean, I mean, they were mispunctuating it. They just didn't know the third, the, the second punctuation. Oh so they, they would they would put the comma, a woman comma without her man comma is nothing. And I go, are you, are you good with that? Are you, how do you feel about that? Well, sounds good to me. I go, really? I go, let me show you this. A woman colon without her comma man is nothing. He goes, wow, I didn't, I didn't see it that way. I go, well, that's how God saw it. God said that there's something not good about Adam. And he caused him to go to sleep, and he made a woman. Because he knew that a man without his woman, he's nothing. And I can stand here and honestly say to you that me without Lourdes, I would not be where I am today. With my business, with my financials, with my spiritual walk, as a father, as a husband, as a family, as a son, I would not be who I am today if it wasn't for who Lourdes is. We work together. We do. We do, but you you, uh, you deserve a lot of that credit. And then I, uh, I came across this picture I want to share it with you guys about perspective again. Let me exit out of here and pull this up. 
Oh, Mike, I have a question like regarding um, that. I mean, why do you think uh, some people like think of choose to like be um be single their whole entire lives, or, like in their like um fifties or sixties? Because I have as I have my friend's um uncle, he he remained um single all the way till he like uh, passed away in his like sixties, never had any kids, and he did just fine. Do you think that's a personal choice or? Everybody's different. Everybody's different. I don't want to say. Everybody's got their story. And let me let me show you. Let me share this image with you guys. So there's a hawk here, right? You see that? There's a hawk there. That's the perspective we might be seeing here. But if I were to take this and turn it upside down the other way around. If you turn it upside down, let me see if I can turn this upside down. Well, if anybody, if y'all, I can't turn it right now, but if y'all can see, if you would look at it upside down, you can see that it's Christ. And the bird becomes his beard. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you see that? Yeah, a little bit. Whoa. And the little notch on top of the bird's nose is his lips. What do you do with view, Mike? Have to go to view and look at the view. <laughs> I see. Yeah, it's pretty interesting. It should be a rotate. Help me out here. Help me out here. Picture format. Picture mm -hmm. format. Also, I think if you hold one of the corners down and then just drag it. Yeah. Yeah. No, it just it just zooms in. Yeah. Oh, right here, right here. I think it's this right. crop, maybe. I think no, it's in that circle. It's gonna cut it. Yeah, right here, actually, in the corner, I did see it a little. It's turning yeah. a little curve. No, it's just to make it bigger. Yeah, I'm gonna go to it. It's all right. I'll, I'll I'll send it on the group chat, and you you guys can see it, and you can turn it on your phone. But it, it's it's again, we're looking at perspective of how we see things. There's always other perspectives of how we see things. So I just I just figured I wanted to just share that with you guys. You might have passed out. Hey, Alex, welcome to join us. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and jump into the video here. Just, want, just wanted to share a couple of things. Um, did anybody uh, at home? And just a reminder that you have um, your scissors on your tables if you decide to do some more today. <laughs> You're welcome to do that. And also just to encourage you all, if you have, and I'm sure you guys all started your budgets, whether it's the everyday app or you want to do the paper thing, um, and hopefully a lot of times the first time around you struggle a little bit, but as you do it each month, it gets easier. Um, so I encourage you to continue on, don't get frustrated because I got frustrated many times at the beginning, but you know, continue doing it, it gets, it gets easier and easier for you. So I just wanted to, um, bring up those two points. All right, let's uh, start the video. Yeah? Let's go ahead and start the video. And don't forget um, to fill in to fill in the lines. You'll see them on the video when they come out the board. For me, I think the emergency fund <laughs> was big because before I did FPU, I, I had no cash. I will say baby step three was harder for us than um, getting out of debt. There were a bunch of times where I thought, there is no way I'm going to be able to do this all the way through to the end. There were days that I was feeling like giving up, like I can't do this anymore. There were some times that I was like, you know, just come home. It's not, it's not <laughs> worth it. But then we would look at our child and say, yes, we can. Life's going to happen. 
So it's nice to have it with a little bit of cash in your pocket when it does happen. We've had a baby. Um, my husband had jaw surgery, so we had to pay for braces. He was laid off just in January. January. So a, ye a year after us getting out of debt, one year later, we were working on step three. For us, we kind of lost a little motivation a little bit because it was like, OK, well, that's behind us. Can we breathe now, you know? All right, up to this point, you have been gazelle intense about paying off your debt. You are finished with baby steps one and two. Can you imagine being completely debt free? Oh, such a great feeling. But I don't want you to go backward. I don't want you going back into debt. So that's why we do baby step three, saving three to six months worth of expenses in a fully funded emergency fund. Because here's the deal. Now that debt won't ever be a part of your life, saving is your only option because debt and saving are complete opposites. With debt, you pay interest. With saving, you earn interest. With debt, you take on risk. Savings lowers your risk. Debt steals your future. Savings secures it. With debt, you owe. With saving, you own. And there are so many things pulling at us in the present. And the practice of saving for the future can sometimes feel impossible. And for me, spending money is way more exciting. And I say that as a natural spender. But having nothing in savings totally stresses me out. I mean, the fear of a crisis honestly forces me to save. The fear that if something were to happen, will we be okay? makes me save money. That's why Winston and I have an emergency fund for our emergency funds because of me. And in fact, women's number one financial fear is the lack of security. Men, husbands, hello, did you hear that? Yes, that is your wife's greatest fear, more than likely. And you shouldn't live in fear of the next emergency. That's why the emergency fund is critical. Proverbs 2120 says, Now in the house of the wise are stores of choice food and oil, but the fool devours all that he has. I like the living Bible translation of this verse. The wise man saves for the future, but the foolish man spends whatever he gets. And did you know that most Americans are acting like fools? Yeah, we do not save. Nearly 80% of Americans live paycheck to paycheck. They use debt to cover emergencies. So when the car breaks down, you go into debt to fix it. So it's no longer a car problem, it's now a money problem. And it's just a cycle. And here's the deal, you guys, emergencies are going to happen. One year, Winston and I had a beach vacation planned and the night before we were going to leave, he said his stomach hurt. This was around 9 p.m. And I was like, okay, well, here's some Pepto-Bismol. <laughs> See you in the morning. And then around 11 p.m., he was like, I can't lay down. Like, it hurts so bad. I need to sleep sitting up. And I was like, hmm, that doesn't sound good. And then about 2 a.m., he was like, I think we need to go to the hospital. Now, ladies, I don't know what your husband's like, but when Winston Cruz says he needs to go to the hospital, he's basically dying. I was like, oh, my gosh. Yeah, let's go. Do we call an ambulance? And he was like, calm down. No, just get in the car. Drive me to the hospital. So we go in. Turns out he had appendicitis, mm -hmm. had to go right into emergency surgery. He came out recovering and I was like, oh my gosh, talking to the doctor, everything was fine. And I was like, hey doc, listen, we are supposed to take a plane out of here in about T minus one hour. We're not gonna make it, but can we still go to the beach? And he was like, well, true story. If Winston's man enough to go, you can go in about 24 hours. I was like, get the wheelchair, we're heading to the beach. I rebooked our tickets and we went. But what was so great about that was in that moment, I remember thinking for about two seconds, ooh, this surgery, all of this is gonna cost a lot. But I didn't really worry about that part because I knew we had our emergency fund. So I could be present with Winston during that whole ordeal and be present enough to book airline tickets again. Because you have to realize the emergency fund gives you cash to cover emergencies so you stay out of debt. And the definition of insanity is to keep doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. 
So if you spend the way you've always been spending, you're never going to develop the habit of saving. And things do get a little bit more complicated if you're married, because usually one of you is a spender and one of you is a saver. And you savers are so excited about this lesson while us spenders are thinking, huh, we're done with baby step two, we're debt free, we can finally spend what we want. Now, you should go out and celebrate, but keep the celebration to a minimum because I still want your foot on the gas. Both of you together need to agree that saving and baby step three has to be a priority. And you can save money if it's your priority. Now, this is true if you're married or single. If you could just imagine someone in your life that you love, maybe a child or a parent or a friend, and they became extremely sick, and the doctor said to you, I have medicine that will cure them, but it's gonna cost $5,000 and you're gonna have to get it in the next two months. And you're like, okay, $5,000 in, in two months. Now, if that's me, I have two little girls at home and I'm like, if it's one of them, heck, I'm out of that hospital. I'm selling everything. I'm working extra. I mean, I am doing whatever I need to do to get $5,000. Because when you have this emotional reaction, you can do anything. If you want something badly enough, you can become a saver. But in today's world, it is so hard to save because you start to see what everyone else is doing. And we start to try to keep up with the Joneses. And what's so frustrating is keeping up with the Joneses 10 years ago, you actually had to see the Joneses in person. Now we just carry them around in our back pockets on our phones. And because of social media, you get this window, this picture into everyone else's life. I remember Winston and I were unpacking from a trip. We had just gotten back with his family and his family took us on this amazing trip. All the kids, they paid for it. It was so generous. It was so great. And as we were unpacking, I was just kind of scrolling through Instagram. And that same week, some of our friends had just taken their daughter to Disney World. Now, Disney World and the cruise household at that time was kind of a cuss word. It kind of was a point of tension for us because I love Disney World. And from the moment our oldest was born, I was like, we got to take her to Disney World. We got to go to Disney World. And Winston's always like, why are we going to spend so much money on something that they're never going to remember? Like this trip would be for you, Rachel. I'm like, mm -hmm. yeah, you're exactly right. Yes, it would. Yes, it would. And so it was always this point of like, oh my gosh, we want to go to Disney World. We don't, we can't, we're not going to. And as I was unpacking my suitcase from a trip, I was already comparing my trip to someone else's. And that was the moment I sat there, I was like, Rachel, what are you doing? But the comparison game is so real. And we have to be careful that comparisons don't just steal our joy in the present, but that they don't steal our paychecks as well. Because people will spend money, money they don't have, to keep up a lifestyle that they think everyone else is living and they're missing out on. So how do we beat this comparison game? Well, the cure for comparisons is contentment. Now, the tendency when you're out of baby step two is that you've sacrificed so much to pay off your debt that you look at your list of wants and you start to say things like, oh, well, I deserve. Like, we've worked so hard. I deserve this. And when you start to feel that way, you're going to start to struggle with contentment. And it's almost impossible to save money when you're not content. Philippians 4.11 says, I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. So instead of chasing of what you want next, you are satisfied with what you have. You will never learn to save if you don't first learn to be content. And gratitude will lead you to contentment. And a heart filled with gratitude, there is no room for discontentment and comparisons. So be grateful and thankful for what you have. And this is not apathy or laziness, but this is just being grateful for where God has you. And gratitude will let you thank God for the journey you're on and everything God has done for you. Baby step three isn't just about saving three to six months of expenses. It also deals with our hearts and our emotions. This step will allow you to keep pushing forward towards your financial goals while giving you the room to learn to be content and grateful for what you have. And that is true financial peace. I remember being in the hospital 
And we had just, at that moment, uh, the month that we, she had gone to the hospital, we got to our three to six months. My wife and I met when I was 22 years old. Our finances, we did everything wrong. We were just choked, had no money. And uh, all of a sudden, you know, everything fell apart. It was just after Christmas, uh, it was New Year's Eve, and Terry was cleaning up in the house, uh, putting away everything. She, she felt something in her neck and uh, came in. She actually came in and said, man, I can't wake my body up. I can't wake my body up. And uh, she, uh, in a matter of two hours, she became uh, paralyzed. Uh, we don't know why, just she stopped walking. She says, I can't walk anymore. And uh, I think back um, with my wife that uh, <laughs> through all that, that three years of getting out of debt, building out an emergency fund. And uh, I think back that, you know, even though she was a free spirit, but she was really committed to this. And I really never realized that. that somehow she knew that uh, maybe she wasn't going to make it. And uh, how she, you know, uh, did this for me, did this for me. So over the next uh, three months, she was in and out of the hospital and passed away in November. It was amazing because, uh, you know, through all that storm, through all the trials, I was able to sit there and not financially, I mean, literally, uh, I could be off for six months and not have anything hit me, no, no financial worries. Nothing of that was of issue. We were able to focus with, with my kids, focus on her mom and go through that process with her. I think that was a huge blessing that we didn't really realize that we were preparing for. How many of you grew up dreaming about being rich and famous. Show of hands. Wow. How many of you are actually rich and famous? Dave, be quiet. You're not included in this. Very few of you. How many of you just didn't raise your hand because you dreamt of being broke? All right, we got a few stragglers there. Thank you, sir, for your honesty. Here's the deal. Young George, full of possibility, full of high hopes, lots of dreams. We've got a photo here. That is a real life photo. Look at the joy in the eyes. Look at the crooked bowl cut. Simpler times. Hey, the 90s were a different time. Young George in the third grade had high hopes of being an astronaut. And there's a real life photo of this. This is as far as I got. My self-published book in third grade. Great cut and color job. Uh, not a great astronaut. I then in the fourth grade had a different dream. I had high hopes of being a rock star. This is me at the fourth grade talent show. Uh, just crushing it. As I have a child-sized guitar that was literally the size of me as a child. And if you zoom in, you can see my groupies hanging out. My fan club is right there supporting me, admiring my Jinko jean shorts. There you go. That was a time capsule of the 90s. I also had high hopes of being a pro athlete. Uh, obviously, there's no photo of that. I know you were all waiting for it. I never even became an amateur athlete. It didn't get very far in that regard. I also, I thought I'd be six feet tall. Again, no photo for that for obvious reasons, but the doctor says there's still hope. And fun fact, I'm 92% to six feet tall. So when you put it that way, it actually feels pretty good. That's an A in my book. I always thought it was gonna be a lack of talent holding me back from my dreams. I truly did. I thought I just need to be talented enough, but it wasn't just a lack of talent that held me back from my dreams. It was money problems. No one tells you that growing up. That's what's gonna be holding you back. Somehow on my list of dreams, I didn't dream of graduating with crippling student loan debt and surviving off of credit cards. But that's where I found myself at 23 years old. And by the grace of God, gazelle intensity and an amazing wife, over a decade later, here I am, debt free, investing for the future, and we'll be in baby step seven in our early 30s. It's an incredible, incredible feeling. But back then, I was living paycheck to paycheck, like many of Americans. And I thought, well, I'm special, I'm unique. I'm not. The research shows that eight out of 10 households live paycheck to paycheck. They're not living in a house. They're living in a house of cards. All it takes is one missed payment 
One job loss, and that house of cards is coming crashing down. This is a problem. You see, even when you're debt free, if you don't have money for the unexpected, you're gonna stay in that cycle. You're gonna stay in that cycle of drama, and you're never gonna find that financial peace that we talk about. And that's where baby step three comes in. Baby step three is to save three to six months of expenses in a fully funded emergency fund. Three to six months of expenses in a fully funded emergency fund. Think about that for a second. What if you had $20,000 set aside and no debt payments? You don't owe anyone anything. Every dollar works for you. Breathe that in, relax your shoulders. What would that be like to be in that financial position? It's a different thing to face a job loss, a pandemic, a bad HVAC, a flat tire, when you have that kind of money sitting there to protect you. That's what this emergency fund does. It protects you from life. Raise your hand if you've had a car repair in the last 12 months. All right, that's about 90% of you. The, the rest of you, you're on the clock. It's coming for you. I'm not trying to manifest it, but I'm telling you it's going to happen. You know, I prayed a lot growing up as a good Baptist, but I never prayed more than when I got in my car. My first car was a Chevy Cobalt, and I, it wasn't an impressive car. Everything was manual on that thing, and you know it's a bad car when they stopped making it over a decade ago. That's so you know you made a bad decision. And this car, uh, it, was, it wasn't doing great. I was driving along the interstate one day, and you get that rattly feeling, and I don't know a lot about cars, but I know rattles aren't good. And so I coast off into the sunset, and I get this thing towed to a mechanic, and here's what the mechanic tells me. Timing chain jumped teeth and the pistons hit valves. Y'all, the only word I knew in that sentence was and. That's it. I didn't even know cars had teeth. This is crazy. It was a brand new sentence for me. And $802 later, I was on my merry way driving along. Isn't it funny how when you're broke, you remember exactly how much every emergency costs you, down to the dollar. These days, I couldn't tell you what the last five emergencies cost me. You just yawn and you pay it and you move on with your life. Take two fingers right here, put them against your neck, right here. You feel that? Dear God, I hope you do. <laughs> That's called a pulse and that means you're alive. And if you've got a pulse, it means unexpected events are going to occur. I hate to be the bearer of bad news here, but it's going to rain. And I didn't invent this concept. Grandmas all across the world invented this concept. Grandmas are the most prepared people of all time. Negative Nancy's, Debbie Downers, those are both grandmas, okay? And Nance and Deb, they're looking out for your financial future, that's all. They want you to know that you need a rainy day fund because it's going to rain. And people tell me, George, don't be a pessimist. I'm not a pessimist, I'm a realist. And let's be real, it's going to rain. And so I've got some visual aids here. Now in baby step one, we had a little starter emergency fund, right? And this is great, right? It'll protect you from the little stuff. This is a George-sized buffer, right? You're, you're not gonna get super soaked, but it's not gonna protect you if something major hits, right? If you're in a real torrential downpour, this is not going to be enough. And that's baby step one. It's, it's never meant to be enough. It's meant to create a small buffer between you and life. But in baby step three, ho, 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 here's what we're doing in baby step three. We are creating a force field between us and life. Y'all, this is an igloo for me. I could go camping with this thing. This is serious stuff. And that's what baby step three is. It's a giant umbrella that helps us never go back into debt ever again and keeps the stress and worry out of our lives, keeps us from getting wet. That's what this is all about. Now, how many of you have heard of Murphy's Law? Show of hands, how many of you have heard of Murphy's Law? Beautiful. Murphy's Law states anything that can go wrong will go wrong. Talk about a pessimist. Goodness, Murphy started it. Now, how many of you have heard of Cole's Law? Oh my goodness, none of you, it's just thinly sliced raw cabbage with carrots served cold with mayo. How have none of you heard of Cole's Law? This is amazing to me. <laughs> that was a free dad joke for you guys in the audience. You're welcome, your kids will hate you. Now, if you don't have an emergency fund, here's what's gonna happen. Murphy's gonna move in, and Murphy's best friend is the big bad wolf. And they're gonna show up, and they're gonna huff and puff, and they're gonna try to blow your house down with a raging party. They're gonna knock over grandma's heirloom lamp and cause a ruckus in your house. So we gotta be the third pig. We've gotta build a house made of brick so that Murphy and the big bad wolf can't come get us. 
And it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. We've got to have the money in the bank to cover these unexpected expenses. Otherwise, you know what's going to happen, right? We're going to go back into debt. We're going to go back into the same cycle, the same old bad habits that got us to where we were. We're going to swipe the credit card to cover the emergencies. We're going to borrow from the 401k. Dear God, please don't borrow from your 401k. Do not do that. Do not destroy your retirement for an emergency. We want that to work for us, for wealth building, okay? These are bad options. Don't put yourself in a situation where you have to go back into debt. You work too hard in baby step two to get out of this thing to ever go back in. And the fully funded emergency fund keeps us from ever going back to baby step two. It's the umbrella, it's the safety net, it's the life raft, it's whatever else you could buy at Bass Pro Shops. Choose your own adventure there. But baby step three turns an emergency from anxiety inducing into a mostly annoying inconvenience. That's what it does. The emergency fund turns a crisis into an inconvenience. That's what I love about it. So let's dig into this. How much do we save up? This is the age old question. Big question here. And there's no perfect calculation. I wish I could just say, save 10 grand, you'll be good to go. But everyone's life is so different. So let me help you decide here. This is how we figure out how much to save. You've got to know your expenses. And you know this already because you've been doing a budget, right? So you know exactly how much it takes to operate your household in a given month. So guesstimate that. And we're not talking about the bare minimum here, right? You might want to keep a Netflix subscription. You might want to keep the gym membership for those of you that refuse to skip leg day. And let me tell you, I've skipped leg day for 32 years. And that is how you fit in skinny jeans, fun fact. So you've got to decide how much you want to put in there. Is this going to be bare bones expenses or do you want some of the luxuries? Now you're not going to go crazy. We're not saving up for the Caribbean vacation in the emergency fund, but we've got to find a middle ground here to where we can do a little bit more than just survive. So once you decide on that number for one month, you're going to multiply it by three or six or somewhere in between. And now you ask again, well, how do you figure that out? Well, here's how we do that. We look at three things. We look at your family life, we look at your income, and we look at health, your health and the family. The more unstable your income is, the more you'll want saved. It's that simple. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to save six months of expenses if you fall into any of these categories. You're married with one income, you're a single parent, you're self-employed or you work on commission or you have a highly irregular income, or maybe you work a seasonal job. Maybe there's a chronic illness in the family that you've got to take care of. In those cases, I want you to save up six months because there's a bigger, meaner storm to weather if something goes down. Now, on the other side of the spectrum, I want you to save at least three months of expenses if you fall into either of these categories. You're single with no dependents and a stable income, or you're married and both of you have a stable income. So let's talk about some examples here. If you're single, and you have no kids, and you're living your best life, you can save three months. Yep, yeah, I heard a shout out. Way to go, man, crushing it, crushing the game. Now, if you're a teacher and a postal worker, both pretty stable government jobs, very low chance of getting laid off here. So you can save up three months. But if you've got a stay-at-home parent and the other spouse works on commission, I want you to save up six months. That's a riskier financial position to be in. So you decide but make sure that this number gives you security. That's the whole point. And if you're married, please agree on this number. Have a conversation with your spouse, meet somewhere in the middle if you have to, but make sure that you both feel good about where you're at. Now we talked about how much to save. Now let's talk about where to put it. You have gotta be careful where you put this thing. Do not put it in the sock drawer. And here's why. According to Samsung, 15 socks go missing every year for the average American. 15 socks go missing. Don't put the money there, it's cursed. It's like the Bermuda Triangle. Who knows what happens to those socks? Don't put any money in there. So here's what I want you to do with that. Your emergency fund should be easy to access, secure, and liquid. Liquid just means you can get to it very, very easily. So I want you to put this money in a simple savings account that's attached to your checking account, in a money market account with your bank, or a high yield savings account with an online bank. And high yield is a hilarious term because guess how much interest you're gonna get at most from any of these? Maybe about a half a percent right now. That sucks. But here's the good news. Earning interest is not the point of the emergency fund. So don't worry about that. An emergency fund is insurance, not an investment. Say not an investment. Not an investment. 
You guys are good. You're following instructions. Here's the difference. Investments are money that make you money. We all like that. Insurance costs you money to protect the things that make you money. You buy insurance to protect your house, to protect your health, to replace your income if you die. That's what it's there for. So your emergency fund is not an investment. It protects you from Murphy and the big bad wolf. And now here's the thing. You're going to have 10,000, 20,000, 15,000 just sitting there in that bank account. Boring. Good. It's supposed to be boring. It's not supposed to be sophisticated. This is not meant to invest in Dogecoin, okay? This is meant to protect you, so do not touch it unless you have a true emergency. Which brings us to my next point. When do you actually use the emergency fund? To do this, we're going to play a little game. It's called Woo or Boo. I'm going to give you a scenario. If it is a true emergency, you are happy about that. We are going to cheer and hoop and holler and woo. If it is not a true emergency, I want you to boo. So we're going to test this out. Let's hear a big woo. Woo! Pretty good. Now let's hear a boo. Woo! You know, I asked for that, and it still hurt a little bit. <laughs> it still felt like a personal attack. So let's test this out. Remember, if it's a true emergency, woo. Not an emergency, boo. Flat tire. Woo! Good. There's some group think there. Some of you were waiting for someone else to chime in. You phoned a friend on that one. All right. The iPhone 14S Max Pro just released and you want to upgrade. Woo! Good work. Not an emergency. Uh, your kid broke their arm. Woo! Well, don't be so happy about it. Little Jimmy broke his arm on the playground. Have some compassion. But that was the right answer. I will say that. There's an emergency vacation that you got to take with your friends. Woo! Good answer. Not an emergency. All right, last one. The dishwasher breaks. Woo! Ah, some mixed reactions here. Some of you know that you can hand wash dishes. <laughs> This is great news. Some of you are under 30 and you refuse to live on Little House on the Prairie. You didn't sign up for that, okay? Now, in the camel house, this might be an emergency, okay? My parents didn't immigrate to this country so I could hand wash dishes. This is a big deal. So I'm going to find a YouTube video. I'm going to repair it myself. More likely, I'm going to call a repairman. Worst case, I'm going to buy a new one. But for some of you, it's really not an emergency, right? You can get by. You can cash flow that. You can watch a YouTube video and fix that thing yourself. Create a sinking fund to get a new one over time. But it's not a true emergency. All right, that was fun. So here's the deal. I want you to ask three questions when it comes to this because an emergency fund is not for emergency fun. See what I did there? You like that? Some of you really enjoyed that. This is not a Bass Pro Shops has a killer sale. This is not I want a new leather couch fund. This is not I forgot Christmas is in December fund. This is for true emergency. So ask yourself these three questions. Is it unexpected, like a sudden job loss? Is it necessary? like a car repair? And is it urgent? Is it urgent? Like your kid breaking their arm. If it's yes to all three of those, you can dip into that emergency fund. But here's the deal. When you use your emergency fund, build it back up. Very quickly, buckle down on your budget for a month or two, whatever it takes, and replenish that thing very quickly. We need to get it back to a solid place. Here's the deal. It's hard to stay motivated in baby step three. Most people will say, They call into the Ramsey show and they'll tell us, hey, I'm through baby step two and it was a blast. I'm super pumped. But baby step three is a slog. In baby step one, you're paying, you're, you're saving up that thousand dollar emergency fund in 30 days or less. It's quick. You're feeling good. And in baby step two, with gazelle intensity, you're paying off that debt in 18 to 24 months. That's the average that we found. And you're feeling good because you paid off that debt. You feel the progress. And most people can finish baby step three in six months or less. So hear this. In two and a half to three years, listen to where you are. You have no payments except maybe your mortgage, and you have $10,000, $20,000 sitting there in the bank to protect you. What an amazing place to be. That is financial peace right there. But it also feels like the hardest step. You're discouraged because there's no immediate reward of paying off the debt and seeing that progress. You're in the middle of the marathon in baby step three. And there's no drink station, there's no balloon arch, there's no one cheering for you, there's no band. And here's the deal, I've never run a marathon, I have no clue if those things actually happen there. 
And here's why. The Bible says very clearly in Proverbs 28 that the wicked run when no one is chasing them. And for that reason alone, I just don't run. I refuse to do it. <laughs> Saving is boring, right? It's not the most exciting thing you can do with your money. And you're tired of working, hustling, grinding to get this thing saved up. And you want to go back to life pre-baby steps, right? But let me remind you what life was like pre-baby steps. It sucked. You were stressed all the time. You were living paycheck to paycheck. You were fighting with your spouse over every little thing. Don't go back. Push through. Get to this foundation and you're going to feel a whole lot better. When you're paying off debt, you're making progress to zero, right? You're climbing out of the hole, out of the negative, back to solid ground. And in baby step three, you're in the positive. Some of you have a positive net worth for the first time in your life. Celebrate that. That's an amazing accomplishment. Here's what I love most about baby step three. You're finally building for the future instead of paying for the past. It's incredible. When you have a fully funded emergency fund ready to protect you, it changes everything. This is a huge emotional step for your financial future. And the funny thing is, when you get that emergency fund, you'll stop having emergencies, just like that. You'll go, yawn, all right, we paid the car repair, whatever. When you're broke, it feels like it's hard to have good luck. When you're not broke, you seem to have more good luck. But it's not really luck, is it? You've just set yourself up in a better position. You can afford higher quality items. You can do the right maintenance on things. You have margin in your life to cash flow all of life's little expenses. So make savings a priority. It has to matter to you. When you get that pad between you and life, it's going to take out the drama, the stress, and the worry. When you're out of debt and you have that fully funded emergency fund, that is a true taste of financial peace. So we've had all these huge expenses. But the beautiful thing is, is that we did not have to incur any additional debt, which is awesome. To have cash in the emergency fund so that when things happen, because they do happen, to just pay for them, it's like, wow, that's crazy. We have our emergency fund, and it's like we just really got our car back a couple weeks ago, and I didn't even think about it. I was like, we took our time getting the car to the shop because it just wasn't that big of a deal. Mm -hmm. We got our full emergency fund, and literally the next day, Murphy came to visit. So it got knocked down by about $4,000. <laughs> it was painful, but, but that's why it's there. At the end of the day, if I lose my job tomorrow, I'm going to be OK. And I think before, I may have been scared to speak up and to say certain things because I needed my job. I don't feel that way now. We had a tenant to, to do over $15,000 worth of damage to a house. But we had the cash set aside to do it. We're going to be fine. Now we're sitting here. We have our six months emergency fund, which is really nice to have because that's a great cushion. That afforded me to be able to stay off of work for five and a half months with my baby. He got laid off, and it wasn't this big panic. It wasn't this big, like, oh my gosh, where are we going to move? Where are we going to do it? And he got a job offer right away, and he was even able to say to them, I, I need to decompress a little bit. Can, you know, do you mind if I don't start for two or three weeks? Things that we thought were not for us or that, you know, we could not have or only rich people got that or I don't know, you know, whatever these things that you tell yourself, we see that if you work hard, if you commit to it, you can accomplish it. The peace of mind you get is just, it's, it's just overwhelming. All right, you've made it through three lessons which covered the first three baby steps. Now, I know most of you are probably on baby step one or two right now, and being debt-free with some serious cash in the bank may seem like a long way off. But listen to me. If you work the plan with intensity and intentionality the way we teach, you'll get there a lot faster than you realize. But you can't be ish. You can't just dip your toes in the water. If you want to start out on the right foot, you've got to jump in with both feet. That's the only way to get a leg up. And I know it can feel overwhelming. I remember being $40,000 in debt between my student loans and my credit cards. And when I decided to go all in, I cut the credit cards. I cut subscriptions. I cut the online shopping. I cut everything because I knew I couldn't keep doing the same things and expect a different result. And you know what? It was a thousand percent worth it. You've probably heard a quote that goes something like this. We overestimate what we can do in a year and underestimate what we can accomplish in a decade. It's true. Back in 2013, I was at baby step one, starting from scratch, staring at a pile of debt. 
And less than a decade later, after following this plan, my wife and I hit baby step seven, paying off our house in our early 30s. I'm still in shock. And I tell you that to encourage you. Where you are right now doesn't have to determine where you'll end up. If you commit to this plan, you could be out of debt and have a fully funded emergency fund in no time. And then, when an emergency comes up, you'll no longer have a financial crisis or a marriage crisis. It'll just be an inconvenience. You'll just yawn and move on. Hmm, I like that. Remember, the sacrifices you're making in baby steps one through three won't last forever. Slashing expenses, working extra jobs, selling a bunch of stuff, I know may not be your idea of a good time, but you will get your life back. Soon enough, you'll be eating out again, going on vacations, and buying stuff without guilt, and obviously without debt. Dave said it best, you're living like no one else, so later you can live and give like no one else. In the next lesson, you'll learn about baby steps four through seven which is where you'll start to shift gears and focus on building for the future instead of paying for the past. I bet you like the sound of that. These next steps are for the long haul, and they will set you up for an incredible life and legacy if you follow them. You'll get to start dreaming about the future you really want. And that's the kind of motivation that makes you do crazy things like skip vacations, take second and third jobs, downsize your house, and yes, even hand wash your dishes like grandma did. You absolutely can do this stuff. I mean, if cauliflower can somehow become pizza, you, my friend, can do anything. Now it's time for your one minute takeaway. Write down one thing you're going to do this week based on what you just learned. What's your one minute takeaway? Right. <laughs> You're done with your one minute takeaway. Let me share a, a quick story with you guys. Um, Lourdes and I, we had a, a, an, emer an emergency fund of a little over $30,000. But we didn't see it as an emergency fund because we kind of thought it was kind of our, our savings. And at that time, it was just before COVID. And I was already starting to think about retirement. And I was saying, you know, retirement's five years away. You know, it's only two, but retirement's five years away. And I'm saying, if I could, if we could just build this, um, if we could just build this addition to the house, I can have it built in 10 months. And um, well, and we got financial advice believe it or not. And and uh, she was really adamant about not doing it. And I, I said, babe, you know, so we went and got financial advice. And we says, well, if we built it, it gets done in 10 months and we're able to uh, Airbnb it, I'll get my money back within a year, two years back. And it'll be paid for. So we, we, we looked into it. We went, we pulled, we pulled, uh, we went ahead and did it. And uh, we got, we got the, the, the loan approved within a year. And the process started happening and then COVID hit. And as soon as COVID hit, everything just shut down. We all know everything shut down. And after a year and a half of dealing with all of this, um, the loan officer says, okay, we're ready to uh, loan you the money and start the construction. So he calls the loan officer. And in the meantime, because we didn't have the money, I told Lourdes, you know what? I'm just gonna go ahead and start building the pack. So those 30,000 something plus money that we had, I thought I was gonna be able to replenish it once we got the loan. And I took that money out and I started building the pad. The pad cost me about $22,000. $22,000 worth of dirt, okay? Dirt, $22,000. But I wasn't concerned because I, I, I figured, you know, I'm thinking, you know, everything's going to play out. You know, we, we have our kids are out of the house. We don't have, we both have secure jobs. We all both have health insurance. She's healthy. I'm healthy. We're doing fine. So I didn't, I didn't see nothing coming 
that could possibly put me in a position that you know, I would need anything. So anyways, when the thing came through, uh, the loan officer calls me and says, hey, you need to talk to your general contractor because um, he said he can't do it for that price anymore. What do you mean? He just, yeah, he's, he, he, you got to call him. I, I don't even want to tell you what he told me, but you got to call him. So I call the guy and say, hey, um, the loan officer is saying he wants, he wants to know what the draws are going to be. And he said, well, Mike, I, just, I, I, I didn't call you, but now you're on the phone. I'll tell you what, uh, it's double the price of what I was going to charge you. I'm thinking maybe, you know, another 40, 50,000, right, for the COVID. No, he doubled the price. So this is crazy. So the deal fell through, and now I got nothing. The money, because I did the pad. The loan, I'm not going to do the loan because the loan is, is a lot of money, and we can't afford it because we can't do it. And as I'm going through all of this, it's our annual inspection of the house, building inspection for our homeowner's insurance. And the inspector comes around and starts looking at the roof. And he starts noticing some problems on the roof. And he says, hey, Mr. Elias, um, you need a new roof. I said, oh, nah, that roof is good. How old is your roof? 20 years old. He goes, yeah, you need a new roof. And then he walks me around, he starts pointing all these rotted areas and little things that are wrong. He goes, if you don't get this roof replaced in three months, we're going to drop you as a homeowner's insurance. An unexpected emergency that cost $24,000 that I didn't have, which we did have, but I spent it on dirt. She practically almost killed me, broke down emotionally. Because we made a bad decision, because I made a bad decision. She didn't want it from the very beginning, but after talking to the financial advisor and things got kind of put there and we saw what the potential was, it's just a risk. I'm a risk taker. I am a risk taker. It comes up with my it comes up with my analysis of my synthesis test that I have I am a risk taker. But I work hard at getting what I want. But long story short. Um, we got the roof, they didn't drop us, and we ended up getting into debt because we had to pay pay for that for that roof that we didn't have the money for. So we got into debt and just one thing uh, one thing after another, and we got ourselves into debt because we didn't have this in place. We didn't have this in place. And as soon as we started this class, we her and I said to her, that was one of our biggest, most recent mistakes with our finances. One of the biggest, most recent mistakes. Guys, this is real. When they're telling you a story, the storm is coming, the storm is coming. You just don't know what it is. It's going to come. Please take this seriously. Take this advice. Cut up those credit cards. If you still got them, cut them up today. Let's cut them. Cut them. It's not worth it. Cut them. It really ain't worth it. Stop holding on to something that's really going to put you in a position where you're going to regret it down the road. Start paying for things. Carry cash around. If you're using a debit card, don't use a debit card anymore. Use cash. Once your cash runs out of your pocket, it runs out. I know people that have used de debit cards. With I've used debit card, and you over and you end up overdrawing too. You end up overdrawing. And now you're overdrawn, and now it, it, it starts dominating the effect, and then this bounces, that bounces, this bounces, that bounces. When you have pocket, it's gone, it's gone. You know you can't spend any more money. Plus, it, 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 like Dave Ramsey says, it does hurt when you don't have any more money. Because, man, my last five bucks, man, and I don't want the five bucks for another week. Peanut butter sandwiches are looking pretty good right now. And that's what we start doing. We start taking peanut butter and jelly sandwiches because we start taking it. And that's what we have to do. And I, and I just I, I, I just wanted to share that, that story with you guys. Uh, we, we've got some things, uh, uh, a story we're going to... Robert, anything you want to add to what I just said um, from what we saw and what I just shared right now? What Mike said, uh, you know, you got to stop using your... Cut up the credit cards. You got to stop using a debit card. Get used to cash. It's natural to go, well, I mean, that's a stretch. My, you know, 
Like if we're honest, like that's the first, when that voice starts to creep up, right? You have to ask yourself, am I getting the results that I want by doing it my way? You've got to remind you, right? Am I getting the, when that voice creeps up, well, that sounds a bit extreme. You need to talk to yourself and go, wait, am I getting the results that I want with the way I've been doing it? Because we have to fight that that urge to say, well, no, I mean, that's a bit extreme, you know? Like, come on. Everybody's got a car payment. It's a line item on every budget. You know, I can manage. I make enough, right? Until you don't, right? Ever hear of Mike Tyson, right? Everybody's got a plan. <laughs> oh, yeah. Right? And then what happens? So just keep that in mind and pay attention to that voice because there's a lot of resistance. I could tell, like in a room this size, every single time. I mean, I, you know, just talking to clients, they get uneasy, but I'm like, wait a second, like, let's examine this again. Right. So the budget's very important. Very, very important. Thank you, Ron. Um, so, um, so you heard about the contentment from Rachel in the video, and you learned about the importance of having an emergency fund from George. This will protect you from going back into debt when Murphy shows up. That's why it's so important to stay gazelle intense through baby step three. Let's do a case study that shows us to do that. So let's go ahead and turn to page 52. And let's look at the case study by two couples who are saving for baby step three. Work through the case study, then we'll discuss the answers as well as how you can stay focused even after you're debt free. So on page 52, um, stay gazelle intense. Let's look at two couples. We'll call them Brian and Heather and Ashton and Kelsey. Both couples were gazelle intense and made extreme sacrifices to pay off their debt. They're finally debt free. Baby step two, check. They take a few weeks to breathe and celebrate before they dive into baby step three. But now they're ready to get their fully funded emergency fund up and running. They look at their current savings and expenses and decide on their emergency fund goal. So here are their numbers. $1,000 current emergency fund, $2,000 current monthly expenses, and $12,000 for fully uh, funded emergency fund goal. That's their goal. It says both couples are single income households and need a six month emergency fund. So they need to, their goal is to save $12,000. So uh, on the next page, it says how to save for baby step three. With $1,000 already in the bank from baby step one, how many months will it take each couple to reach their $12,000 goal? So you have those two couples there. Brian and Heather continue celebrating and let off the gas. They only put $300 per month in their emergency fund. So how many months does it take them to save? Well, 1,037 months. Ashton and Kelsey take uh, the gazelle intense. They stay on there and put in $1,000 per month. That was going toward their debt right into their emergency fund. And it, and it only took them 11 months to save the 12000 Because they already had 1000 So that's right. So the moral of the story is to let off the gas. If you don't let off the gas, Take what you were throwing at debt and save it into your fully funded emergency fund. Keep up your gazelle intensity through baby step three. Respond to the following questions. Remember to stay gazelle intense in baby step three, but when the but what's the on um, what's the one way you'll celebrate being debt free before you kick it back into high gear? If these couples asked you about investing or paying off their mortgage before completing baby step three, what's the advice you would give them and why? Well, think about this, guys. This is why I was saying to you, what is your expectations out of this class? And what are your goals and dreams? If you have goals and dreams, you're going to be gazelle intense. You're going to want to save those three, 
three to six months of living expenses. The thing is, do you want it? What is it you want? Right now, that construction that I was telling you about, I'm paying that cash. I'm not getting a loan. And the general contractor is me. I'm paying myself. I don't need to pay somebody to tell me how to do construction. I'm pretty wise. I mess up pretty every now and then. Okay, I just recently messed up in a couple of things there. But there's always people around me that give me some good direction and good, good advice. Okay, so now my construction, up to where I am right now, my construction, it's all paid cash. I owe nobody no money, none of the workers money, you know, and and, it, and the stuff is getting paid for cash. At the end of that construction, Lourdes can say, we paid it cash. And I didn't put her in a financial situation that she never wanted to be in from the very beginning. Okay, but in order for me to do this, I have to give that tense, meaning I have to go out there and work, 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 work. Because then I'll be able to live like nobody else once I'm not, I'm living like nobody else right now so that later I can live like nobody else. Okay, which I can chill back and relax. Live and give like nobody else. Yes. That's the goal. So that, this is what, so, uh, and our next page is our, dis is our discussion. 10 minutes of discussion. Let's go ahead and, and we can do this as a group since we got people online too. Um, go ahead, read this. Um, let's go ahead and read on page 54. Um, it says, whether you're taking this class online or in person, be honest with your answers and remember to encourage one another. By now you've seen and experienced the power of the dead snowball. How can its momentum help you knock out your emergency funds? Why is it? Why is that important to know? Who wants to answer that? Anybody? Yes. So with this, I know personally, I've got multiple credit cards and pretty high minimum payments. So let's say I'm doing the minimum payments and I do the snowball, take care of everything. Say I've got eight hundred dollars that I've been spending to get that done. Well, now I know that I can use eight hundred dollars out of my income to put that towards the emergency fund every month, right. and that can continue to grow the emergency fund a lot faster than if you say, "Oh, I've got all my credit cards. That's eight hundred dollars that I've spent every month on them. Well, let me just put four hundred into it and continue from there and see what happens." That's exactly. how you're kind of doing it halfway. Yeah. Yeah, you're paying you're actually paying yourself instead of paying your debt to all these creditors. You know, and that's the whole plan. The money that you you were paying you were using to pay the bills, you're paying yourself. It's going into your emergency fund and that's how you're going to grow your emergency fund. So but remember you're going to start with your, your shortest your credit yeah, card has to the least credit. amount and you start paying into that with intensity. Yeah. You pay as much as you can. Don't do your minimum payment. You put in more than what you can to pay it off quicker. And do the minimum of the other out. ones. Yeah. Okay. And then once it's paid off, right? Everything that you were paying on this one, now you transfer that on yeah. to your next credit card and do the same thing. And before you know it, all those cards are paid off. Yeah. yeah. But but make but make sure that you pay off all your debt before you start throwing more money into the emergency fund that you got that knocked out. So you can go ahead and work on that step. Go ahead, first. So about like um two uh two uh, weeks ago so I had an oil change and then a couple weeks like and then a week or two like later this was a couple days before I went to um, uh, New York for a couple days because I had a wedding to go to um up um up up there I got my uh, oil change and tires rotated and then I pull up to the um tire shop on 10th Avenue in Congress because like um I needed um new I needed my tires rotated again pretty bad and I was losing like um tr i was losing tread and all that stuff which like um uh, uh, so like that that cost me um a good amount of money and i ended up putting that on a credit card or two like uh day later and then that got me a little bit about twelve dollars. just remember all chris that your oil change your tire rotation that's a regular expense it's an emergency you budget for that i know but i was like losing tread so okay but it doesn't matter you, that, it's, you budget for that you gotta you gotta set your goals because everybody's got to change your tires, everybody's got to change your oils. It's all about doing a budget because you got those. You got to work it out in your budget. When is it that? When is it that you need your oil change? That's why every month you got to create a new budget every month. So if you're seeing that your tires are, are starting to get low, you know that maybe you, have, you, you can take it, and they'll tell you how much longer you can drive with those tires. And so it doesn't become an emergency. 
So you take it to the tire store. He says, hey, yeah, you got you got about an eighth of an inch of tire tread still. Okay, so you can probably drive it for another two months. So now you put that budget. I got two months that I need to save up for to replace the tire and not use your emergency fund. And that's what they call you, the sinking fund. You, you yeah. plan for it. Yeah, I realized ever since I've been on 28, I've been out of high school for 10 years. I never had an emergency fund because when you graduate high school, they don't really tell you all this stuff, too. I mean, they just. Well, we're they, learning it now. Oh yeah, of course. All you right. just graduate from high school, and they're like, "Bye, uh, bye, Mr. Wilmot. Have yeah. a good life. Try to figure everything out on your own now." So. Thank you, Chris. All right, uh, over Victor. Rod, take number number two from your table. When have when have you wished you had Mur uh, Murphy repellent in your life? Have how would you fully fund emergency fund? have turned that crisis into a simple inconvenience. Anybody in that table want to share that? You had a situation like that going? I, I definitely had one. When I was 26, I had a really bad medical episode. Um, I ended up with an intestinal abscess, a ruptured appendix, and six wow. inches of dead intestine. Wow. Uh, luckily, I was living at home at the time with my parents. Mm -hmm. But basically, I ended up with uh, $130,000 oh worth yeah. of medical debt. Insurance covered most of it. I had to pay about 7000 of that because I had decided to switch from a HMO to a PPO mm -hmm. that year, and they only covered 90% of major medical. Mm -hmm. um, so because I was living at home and because I was saving money and that kind of stuff, I had that emergency fund and I was able to pay off that money. But had I really looked into the plan and saw what it was offering, I could have avoided that $7,000 and paid two fifty dollars just for the emergency fee. Mm -hmm. oh, um, wow. Thanks for sharing that. That's a great example great of example. how things can happen, you know, mm -hmm. when you least expect it. You know, and it's always, um, it's nice having that security, you know, and, and that emergency fund. So whenever life happens, because life is going to happen. Jason, your table? Go ahead. Go ahead. Remember, okay. speak up loud so they can hear you online. In building your emergency fund, consider su suggested savings range three to six months of expenses. Which amount makes the mo most sense for your life and gives you the most peace? Six months. Ten months. So it's, cool. it's I mean, George, um, uh, he shared a great example. You know, he gave us a good. Um, Sorry. Why, why do you say six months, Jason? Share it. Um, I mean, three. I've, I've been in between jobs before, and sometimes it will take three months before you and find a job. So I don't think that three is really enough. Um, six, you know, once you've got six set aside, then it'll give you some peace of mind and breathing room that, you know, God forbid something happens, you know, you've got bills paid for the next six months. Okay, good. Thank you. What are you saying? Um, I was just saying that um, George shared a perfect ex example how everybody's, you know, the different scenarios pretty much on what he uh, recommends as far as how much, you know, how many months you have to, of, a, of an emergency fund you have to save for. And uh, everybody has a different scenario, but um, that was a great uh, tool, uh, what he shared, you know, and giving you a, a, an idea of how much money you need to save for your households for your scenario, depending on whether you're single, you're married, uh, or if you have two incomes versus just one income coming in. So that was a good example. Gabby, Jordan, uh, can you guys take uh, question number four and share and share with uh, that one online? One second, let me see. Do you want me to read it? I read it and then just go ahead and respond to the question. Okay. Once you're debt free, it can be tempting to let your foot off the gas and taper off the intensity. But we want you to move through the first three baby steps as fast as you can. What are some practical things you can do to maintain your gazelle intensity in baby number three? Baby step number three. Um, definitely cutting back on eating out. 
and just what I was talking with Jordan is basically like if you're craving this is something that we were talking about if you crave to go out instead of going out you grab that money that you would spend out in a restaurant and put it in in like towards the baby step number three or if you know we already had baby step number one so we used to start accumulating and you cut it down to I don't know once or twice a month and um, I don't know, that's how we've been doing it lately since we started everything. And it's been working out. Another thing, instead of, you know, I um, love Starbucks. Instead of going out drinking Starbucks, we make it at home now. And it saves a lot of money. Great alternative. Yeah. And you can yeah. still have your coffee, your Starbucks coffee. Can I, uh, that's right. Can I share something with you? Transparent. You guys speak up so they can hear you. All right. So just uh, um, I, I shared with you guys a couple of uh, week a week ago that um, my wife actually was step free um, from it a couple of whatever year ago. Or so, um, well, in the point in the sense of what you were saying, we had five credit cards when we took this class, and we were about twenty one thousand dollars debt, and we were paying two hundred dollars. Interested into each credit card when it was only a minimum of 100, right? But then when we saw the when we got this class, we took the 200 from here to uh, about 150 from here, 150 from here, well, 100, 100, 100, and then we added 600 and we did the snowball effect, right? And then after the fact that we did that, we were able to save a thousand dollars a month every month, okay, every month. When we were debt free, when we got to the, I think it was like level four, four or something. Baby step four. Baby step four. Uh, you know, we got into this thing that my wife was like, well, I need a car. What happened over here with the news talking about? We ended up getting a car for my wife. Now we're paying $700 towards this car. When she had a car that had no paint, then uh, we got into a, a, a bigger a wedding band that she wanted that costed us another $9,000 on top of the ring that she already had. And now I've been paying $410 towards it every month. So when I try to explain this to my wife, do you actually see that we cannot save a thousand dollars anymore? Okay, it's a big thing. I mean, I it literally. I, I wish I could pull my hairs out when I and I don't have it, you know. But sometimes we don't see that. Okay, and what we see is that we have the money, and we're able to go and spend it and get what. What it said, what we want, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And I'll never forget the day taking my wife to this dealership. And all I was thinking, and I was walking behind her, and I was like, she is just a, uh, what's that word I want to say? Um, uh, like this. Very demanding? Well, well, no, like, uh, like, oh, all right, she's just, she's just going to get caught. But she doesn't even know. Like when I go fishing, I go catch fish, and that fish doesn't know me. He, he, you know, fish got caught. Well, that's my wife. I was looking at my wife that way. I was like, she's just gonna get caught. She didn't even know how much money she's gonna pay an entrance. How much this? You should, right, have, much... you should have let her do right all the arrangements. Right. And stayed up. <laughs> and I stood away from it, right? And I was just like, okay. And then there's some little talks that we always have, and I always say to her. Do you see what I was trying to tell you before? Mm -hmm. We had this. We were able to save this, but because of what we want and what you wanted, yeah. and I wanted to make you happy, right? That's you know, that's what a husband Everybody right, like, right? Oh yeah. So I mean, I didn't want to say it, but right. <laughs> and I allowed that to happen instead of stepping the foot, you know, in, in Spanish we say yeah. you know. Step on it and with no, love. it's not right with love. love. And it's no, it's not gonna go that way. But unfortunately, I didn't do it that way. And and I was and now I'm back into this 
situation where I cannot save a thousand dollars because here I'm back into this debt situation again. And she okay. she sees that difference. That what, what does she say about she it? Does, but, she does, but you know it? because of that she thinks that oh no everything's going to be fine everything's going to be okay. No, it's not going to be okay because. <laughs> We don't have that extra money mm -hmm. exactly. that we should be having. Exactly. You know, if something does happen to you, you know, I wish she was here, you know, to be honest with you. And she's actually taking a class to be a registered behavior technician. And that's what she's actually trying to do. And she wants to make her, you know, her money a little bit higher than what she's making now. But it makes it even harder when this is a teaching that she needs to learn. Mm -hmm. And she's not here for this, right? And then with me being frustrated, sometimes I don't even want to explain it to her because it's going to go walk you through one ear and go out through the other, right? I get it. Because get it. you get you guys, you, you understand what I'm saying? I, I get yes, it. Yes, sir. So it, it, this is very important. And, you know, saving $1,000 a month, I mean, that's good. But, and this is, and this is where, you know, when we, it's important when you're married. And you're in a relationship, it's important to do this class together. Again, and right. so I, I I I get you. I get you. I try reaching out to her. Um, and you know, and I understand she's got the other class that she's gotta do, but um it's it's important that you guys, that couples do this together. Yeah. Because you have this when you're married, when you're in a, uh, in a relationship and you're married, um, you need to do this together. Um, just like we learned at the beginning with Dave Ram, you know, when he was talking about the fact that, or um, Rachel, um, how there's always one in the couple that's the budget person, that's the numbers person, and the other one is the spender. He, and Mike, you know, I'm I'm the budget person, I'm the nerd, and Mike was always the spender, but and he was and he never liked to sit down and 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 look at numbers or, or see the budget, but he knows it's something that we have to do as a couple. Right. You know, it's it's something that that's not his comfort zone and it's not something he enjoys doing, but he knows it's important, right. you know, for our future. And we need to work on this together, whether we like it or not. We need to because it's for our own good. Um, so, it's you know, very it's important. important. It is very important. And, yeah. you know, I'm actually getting a lot more in this class than what I got in the last wow. class. Yeah. Actually hearing a little bit more, right. cleaning my ears a little bit. Yeah, you always, you always catch, I mean, no matter how many times you do this, you always I'm just you know, pick more. up new things that you <laughs> didn't pick up in the last one and the last And being in there. these situations, you know, it's real life, right? Mm -hmm. You know, because you really, you know, like I, like I said, I was explaining to her, look, two, just two months ago, I was like, look, we cannot even save $400 right now, okay, because of the situation that we're in. And, you know, of course, I got other things, you know, I got to Three hundred dollars note of child child care yeah. for one kid yeah. a week, yeah. not a it, month, a week. It's a serious issue, and, and, serious issue. and you need to work on it together. And you need to be firm. The one that's the budget person needs to be firm, just like yeah. I'm the firm one in our relationship, you know. And and Mike, Mike has grown leap, leaps and bounds because you know he when we were younger he was I was always a budget person and he likes to spend. But and you know, I, a lot I, I spoke now. with Michael earlier today, and, and you know, it was a situation that you know the old Victor would get very, 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 mm -hmm. very upset. And you know, I'm just a new Victor. I, I'm not gonna get upset. I'm just gonna the only thing I can do is just show you where yeah. we are. And that's all I can do. Yeah. You know? Let me share with you guys good good stuff, guys. Let me share with you guys another example. The case study that we just went over. This is another case study in his book. <clears throat> And he talks about Ben being 19, Arthur being 27, each of them investing a year, $2,000 into a money market. And maybe, you, Robert, you can kind of uh, jump in on this a little bit. Okay. But for eight years, Ben's putting $2,000 a year into a, into a market, into, into whatever, that, and Robert can elaborate on that. By the end of the eight years, okay, he's he's already saved, he's already invested uh Twenty-seven thousand five hundred and fifty-one. It's what money's what he's gotten in return by having it invested. Okay, uh, Arthur doesn't start until he's twenty-seven years old. He hears about this. He maybe did up to you, and I'll say, you know what? I I need to start doing this. And he jumps in at age twenty-seven and starts putting two thousand dollars a year, and he does this for sixty-five years. Ben stopped at age twenty-seven. 
He no longer touched the money. It's in the market, doesn't touch it for the rest of his life until he's 65. Doesn't touch it until he's 65. After, by the time he gets to 65 years old, Ben has $2,288,996. That's how much these eight years gave him a return by the time he's 65 because he started early. Ben kept putting $2,000 in. All it takes 65, and all he gets back is $1,532,166. Bob, you want to talk a little about that? Yeah, so that's a that's using uh, an example of a like of a growth mutual fund. Right. So in that example, Ben puts in the least amount of time, but because he started early, the rest was just compounding. Do you all understand compounding? I don't want to make any assumptions. Uh, can you tell me what that term actually like means? Compound it. Yeah, so it means interest upon interest upon interest. So when you, whenever you go to the bank and you, you put in money, you deposit something. They pay you interest on your hundred dollars, let's say, right? And then that hundred dollars becomes one hundred and five dollars. Now you get interest on that hundred and five plus. Now you've got one hundred and seven. Now you get interest on the 107 plus the interest you've already earned. So it's interest, your principal plus interest plus interest of principal, and it just multiplies. It's not simple interest. Simple interest is where you just get 1% for the whole year, and that's it. So your $100 goes to 105, whatever that is, right? 5% or whatever, and then that's it. There's no compounding on top of that. It's simple interest. So sometimes they'll say, oh, you get 5% for five years, simple interest. That means you're getting 1% every year. That's not compounding. That's not a good way to grow money. But the, the, the example here is if you started early, and I get it, it's like, well, hey, you know, if I'd started early, Robert, you know, <laughs> but hey, pass this on to your kid, you know, pass this on to, to, to young people because that makes a big, big difference. Um, but what I will tell you guys is that, you know, it's funny, I just keep thinking that the Bible it says that there's no condemnation, right? Like, hey, what you didn't do, you can't go back and change it. So it's what you do now, okay? It's what you do now. Because now you're responsible for what you've just heard, right? And I'm just going to challenge you guys. Is what you're doing working? If it is, great. If it's not, this works. This works out. I just want to speak to what you said, brother. Um, you know, I'm a big fan of the, the dry erase board. My wife and I, we've been married 11 years. And three months ago, I had to make probably the biggest decision that I've had to make for our family in the 11 years that we've been married. And I, I took out one of these. We had it in the corner. I took it out. And I said, I need your undivided attention, hon. Like, I need you to focus with me. Like, I said, hey, at this on this day, at this time, I need you to go over. I, I want to go over what's happening. I waited until it was serious enough where I knew that I was going to have to make this decision. That was me switching companies. Okay. I was in a very comfortable spot, a very good spot, a spot that most people would have never left. Okay. And so I had to, you know, why would somebody leave something comfortable? Because you're comfortable. If you don't know what you want in life, then guess what? You're going to settle for comfortable. And comfortable is not going to cut it. Not if you have goals, but if you don't know what they are, right? If you don't write them down, you'll never know when opportunity is in front of you. I, I'm talking to somebody in this room. I know I am. Okay, so when I did the board, I just literally split it in half and I said, okay, if we continue on the path that we are, here's what we can expect. And I just wrote it out. Bam, 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 bam. I said, if we make this transition, because we're a single income household, by the way. We homeschool all three of our children. My wife is very busy. <laughs> right? She, she manages a, a scout troop. She oversees it for, for Palm Beach Gardens. 50 families belong to that group. That's just volunteer. You know, and she's driving the kids everywhere to their activities and so forth. So very busy household, single income. I work on commission, by the way, right? Or fees um, that I charge. But so for me, I'm in agreement with you, at least six months of emergency savings, right? Yeah, sure. If something happens. 
Um, but when we did this, the second part was, here's what we want. The things that we talk about, if you don't talk about what you want with your spouse, if you just kind of like, well, I've got my goals and dreams. Yeah, but if you haven't communicated that with your spouse or even ask them like, hey, what do you want? What do you see? What would you like to see for our family? How, you can't expect them to do the things that are necessary to fulfill an outcome that they're not aware of. Am I making sense mm -hmm. in saying that? So that could look like a piece of paper for you. I'm a big fan of this. Maybe it's because I, I like to teach. And we just wrote it out. And then I said, if I don't have your buy-in, I'm not doing it. I'm going to say that one again. If I don't have your buy-in, I'm not doing it. Because that's where the rubber meets the road. If this is the future that we want, then we're going to have to make the change. We're going to have to make the leap. And there was some faith involved, believe me. It was a leap of faith because I couldn't see what the other side is going to be. And I'm still in that. Okay. Um, and she said, okay, that makes sense. I said, well, in Jesus name, let's go. But the difference was we talked about it. We laid it out, but we started with what do we want? What are we trying to get to? If that's not clear, you're going to make mistakes. You're going to make mistakes anyways, but you could avoid a lot of them. If you're not clear on what you want. If you haven't done that part, I promise you, it's going to be hard to follow the rest of this process. You know, you guys get together as husbands and wives and say, what do we want? Like, what do we want? And this is where you get a chance to tackle it. Because that's always the, that's always your, that's, that's your carrot, right? Like, oh, this is so hard. We, we, do we want this or not? Like, well, what do we want to do? But you're going to be on the same page because... You had to have been on the same page from the very beginning in order to pursue that. Okay. So I, you know, it's it's great to be vulnerable and believe me, we we made mistakes as well. Um, I, I could tell you that early on I borrowed from my 401k twice, regret it ever doing that. Don't ever do that. I did it early on uh, in my working life, and I made excuses and so forth. And yeah, I made the money. I made it back, but guess what? It didn't go back into saving. I just raised my spending until I finally realized and I, I finally learned like, okay, I, I can't do this. I got babies now. I got babies now. I got, you know, I've got a family maintained. And you know what? That was so compelling that I said, I got to leave where I'm at because I need to make some hard choices. Okay, I'll leave you with this quote. I'll never forget it. You all know who John Maxwell is? Oh, yeah. So the first time I heard John Maxwell was in San Diego. He was doing a leadership summit for, you know, for pastors and business leaders. And he spoke for like an hour. I don't remember everything he said, but I remember one thing that he said, and I'll never forget it. He said that in life, when the, the earlier in life that you make the difficult choices, you then get to manage those choices later in life. It's so hard to... to make those hard choices later in life so if you can avoid making tough choices later in life make them now sacrifice now do the hard stuff now so that then you can manage choices you can manage them it's different to manage something than to have to decide i made a decision to leave california and move here for my family and i dealt with the consequences of that i, I can tell you that it paid dividends in doing that and that was a decision based on my marriage. I said, I'm a, I'm a husband now. I'm a father now. I need to make difficult choices. But I'm going to make the difficult ones first. And I've been living here 11 years. Never in a billion years could you have told me 20 years ago, hey, hey, what do you think about moving to Florida? I'm like, are you nuts? I live in San Diego. Why would I ever set foot in Florida? I don't even visit Florida. And here I am 11 years later, right? But God is good, and he responded to that. God will respond, guys. If you take that step and say, you know what? I'm going to do this in faith, and I'm going to do it because it's the right thing for me to do. God's going to honor that. But it's scary. That's why many of you haven't cut up your credit cards yet, because you're scared. That's why some of you are going, but wait, wait. I mean, what if? It's because you're scared. There's fear. But what does the Bible say about fear? 
Do Every not fear. Day, all day long. Yeah, don't fear. Don't fear. He's got you. Let that be your first leap of faith. Lord, you got me, right? Yes, sir. You got me, right? Yeah. I'm gonna do I'm gonna do it that way. It's so funny. We put faith on so many other things. God's going, I mean, test me on this. We haven't even gotten into tithing, but test me on this, right? So that let that be a, a takeaway, right? Get you and your spouse on the same page. And the best way to do it is why are we even doing this? Why are we here? Why, why do we want this? And then after you have that, it makes it much simpler. I'm not going to say easier, but you've simplified it. Because if you don't understand your own why, you're you're not going to, it's not going to work. Don't do stuff you don't understand. Mm -hmm. It's funny. All of this stuff is simple. None of it is rocket science. I, I think a third grade math can handle this. If you don't have it, use a calculator, right? But it's not that difficult. 80% is what you do. 20% is what you know. And if you don't believe that statistic, you can Google and YouTube anything today. If you want to learn how to do something. So why is everybody in debt then? If, if knowledge is the issue, it's not. It's what we do. And we have to fight the flesh, the tendency to want to compare ourselves to other people or the fear that is in us that we lack because perhaps we've never seen the other side. But God is faithful. He is going to get you through it. When you honor him and you manage what he's entrusted you with, God's going to surprise you like he promises to do. Thanks, Robert. Thank you, Robert. You know, we have several couples here that are not married, um, but are looking to get married. And that's probably one of the biggest debts that couples start right off the bat is when they get married because they, they overspent what they could at a, at, a, at their wedding ceremony. If And I, I talk about this all the time when, when, when I find out a couple is getting married. I go, are you feeding your guest or you're feeding your future? Because you're spending ten, twenty thousand dollars on a merit on a wedding ceremony on the reception that you're probably not even going to remember to feed all these people that really don't care about your future. They're just there to enjoy the moment. It's not worth it. It's not worth it. Small, simple wedding, make it memorable at the at the least expense that you can. And you're gonna and then and you know what? Those ten, twenty thousand dollars you would have spent in your wedding. Think about those ten, twenty thousand dollars can go towards a home that you're going to spend 20, 30 years in. That's where your money needs to go, you know, or a future vacation that you can actually afford and not get into debt and pay cash for. Those are the things. Um, I think if you don't mind, uh, we're gonna we're gonna go into the ending of the lesson. We're just gonna read up the wrap up questions here, and then if you can just read through them, if you don't mind, but go ahead and notice. Um, uh, so let's just turn to page 55. 55. As a reminder, you need to complete these action steps before we meet for the next lesson. So I'm just going to read these uh, real quick. And then just real quick, on uh, if you turn real quick to page 58. It says, when you're ready for baby step three, figure out what amount your fully funded emergency fund needs to be. So that's something that you guys got to work on for homework. Also, come to this page and write that number down. When you reach your goal, come back to this page and mark the date you finished baby step three. So um, for homework, uh, on top of the action steps, go ahead and read the next few pages on page 58. Um, to talk to figure out um, how much you need for your uh, emergency fund to build that up. All right, Matic, so Action steps. It's time to leave out what you just learned. Complete each of the action steps before the next session. Calculate your biggest step three goal. It's time to protect yourself from Murphy. Before you can save three to six months of expenses, you need to figure out how much you need to save. First, determine if you need three or six months of expenses saved. Look back at the lesson for a quick reminder. Second, multiply what, that number by how much you spend on essential expenses each month. And just like that, you got your baby step three goal. Okay, remember, we're talking about just writing out your goal. Obviously, a lot of us are not there yet to do baby step three. Maybe a lot of us are still on baby step one, trying to get the $1,000 in there, and that's okay. One step at a time. 
baby step one, then baby step two, go with, with the zone intensity, paying off of your debt, and now you're, you're then you're going to go into baby step three. Yeah. And that's all we want to know is just write that goal out. What is it that you want? And it could be that dream. It could be that marriage. It could be that that vacation. It could be that car. It could be that home. Whatever that goal is, we want to make sure that we have it written down. Open a separate account. No matter which baby step you're on, make sure your emergency fund is in a separate account from your checking account. It needs to be easy for you to get to, but not too easy to spend from. Here are some options. A savings account connected to your checking account, a money market account that comes with a debit card or check writing privileges, or an online bank where you can transfer money quickly and directly to your checking account. Now, when Lourdes and I did this, we didn't want to put it in our check, a uh, link to our checking account, because if you have a tendency to say, well, you know, we got an extra thousand dollars here. And if we need to uh, write a, an extra check or spend a little extra, it'll just pull from our savings account. We said, no, 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 we don't want to do that. We put our, we put our $1,000 in a whole different bank where we actually had access to, but not, but not easy, necessarily easy access to. We didn't have any, in other words, we didn't have any other accounts in that bank except that emergency yeah. fund. So like That's that, right. yeah. That's what I told Manny and Sabrina right. last week yeah. because they asked right. me and I said, open well, a different account with both of your names on it, but savings account uh -huh. and also accessible, don't put it in your... Yeah. And, that, and then you have it also set up where it automatically withdraws from your checking account. Yeah, your, when, uh, check I, work. when I get paid, I have, I have an automatic withdrawal that goes, that goes directly to that account. That account. So we don't even no. so we don't even have to like, Ugh, you know what I'm saying? It's already yeah. gone. It's there automatically. Okay, Latika. Track your transactions in every dollar. Make sure you're sticking to the budget you set by tracking your transactions. If you connect your bank to every dollar, this takes minutes. Just drag and drop the transactions into the right budget lines and you're done. Pro tip. This is also a great time to make an, any edits to your budget lines and see where you are accidentally overspending. Okay. Read exactly how much do you save for baby step three on the next page. Want to see a real example of how to calculate your baby step three goal? Check out the next page. So that's um, that's what you need to review for homework. So just make sure that you get all those action steps done and start reviewing um, how much you need to save for baby stuff. Um, is everybody getting the email that we're sending out every week? Or, or is there anybody not getting the email? I saw some of it today. Okay. I want to make sure everybody's getting their email. So, um, remember, if you have any questions, Reach out to your table coaches. If they don't have the answer, then you can reach out to Lutus and I. And if we don't have the answers, um, remember the coaches are available online through FPU. You have a one full year membership with access to the FPU coaches. Take advantage of that. Even if it's just a simple question, use it, use it. Guys, the more you attack this with intensity, the more results you're going to get out of it. You know, he gave me the he gave me the the the, the example of what uh, uh, John Maxwell said. Okay, another one that I like using all the time is that you're free to choose. You're free to just sit back and you say, you know what, I'll just wait till next Tuesday and I'll open it up the day of the class and not go through it. I take this book with me to work every day. Every day I take this book with me to work, and on my downtime, I'm reading. I don't need to be watching all my social media stuff on my downtime. I'm reading. Yeah, I check my social media every now and then just because I, I, I do a lot of my witnessing through social media with people. You know, as, as a pastor, I, I, I try to see where people are at. But this is where I'm at right now because I want to help you guys and I want to help Lourdes and I to get in a better place. So we're free to choose. We can either go at this with all seriousness or we can just say, you know what? It is what it is. I invested eighty dollars. You guys invested eighty dollars. Don't let your eighty dollars go to waste. Use it, okay? Use it. Take advantage of what you of what you invested. Take your eighty dollars and put it to work for your future. We're not we're not making it. Notice that I'm making I'm making money off you guys here. Okay, we're not. We're here to we're here to pay forward what God's blessed us with. We're paying it forward by giving you guys the knowledge and the ability to do this, so that in the future you guys can pay it forward to help other people. 
So again, you're free to choose, good or bad. Just remember this, you're not free from the consequences of those choices. So those consequences could be good or bad. Depending on what you choose, those choices, that free will that God gives you in Galatians 5.13, if you do good with it, you're going to get good results back. If you decide to do bad, just remember, you're not free from the consequences of those choices. And another thing is a cultural thing. You know, we I came to this country, I didn't have a credit. The first thing they tell me, you have to build a credit. Right. You know, you have to start building your credit. You have to, in Colombia, we never buy anything with credit. Right. Money. You have the money you buy, you don't have the money. You don't buy it. Buy it. You don't get it. So, so the culture is telling you that you need to do this. Right. And I've done it for many years until we had to declare bankruptcy, you know. <laughs> Then I learned the hard way, and you do not learn. But uh, it's hard to let go because you grow up like that. You right. grow in this country like that, and it's scary. Right. But if you look at it the other way, you're going to have the freedom because all those interest payments that you're doing, yeah. you're paying for interest at your own debt. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So you have to focus on the what is going to happen in the future if you do this. Right. right now it's scary and you don't want to do it, but if you focus on what you can do in the future, it's going to feel easier. Well, not easier, but it's scary. Yeah. Nice. Thank you. Casey, you want to close this out in prayer? Sure. The, uh, we thank you for being able to come together tonight. We're humbled that uh, we can take these steps in your future and that you'll be with us uh, with our finances, God. Help, help us to give us peace in our lives. Help us to build uh, our families, our businesses, um, so that we can feel comfortable and, and satisfied and, and, and humble in the prosperity that you give us, Lord. Please help us um, to heal those that need to be healed. Continue to give us travel mercies any place we go. Protect us from the evil one, Lord. And uh, we thank you, Jesus. Amen. 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 Hi, guys. I'm like, thank you for joining us. We'll see you all next week. All right, Alex. Feel better, brother. Uh, Robert, 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 Robert,